Well, a good Friday morning. Thank you for tuning in to the Gardener's Corner program, a Friday feature here on TV Channel 10, located on position 191 on Charter Communications, also on WKRX 96.7 FM. My name is Rob Hall. The Gardener's Corner program today brought to you by Sandlin Golf Cars and T.G. Brooks Company. We appreciate you tuning in. We are live in the studio. We hope that everybody had a real nice Easter weekend this past weekend. And uh, we actually had a recorded edition of the Gardener's Corner program for last week due to Good Friday. But we are live in the studio, and um, it's a nice a sunshiny day out today. And uh, supposed to get pretty warm today and not quite as warm on Saturday. But here it is, springtime. And it's time to get out and start working in the lawn and garden. Mm -hmm. I would like to make welcome all the way from the North Carolina Cooperative Extension Service, a man that's been there, done that, Mr. Carl Cantaloupe. <laughs> been there, done that. I don't know what I've done. <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing you said you're going to be doing this afternoon is uh, cutting asparagus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's asparagus is, is growing now. It's with all this, uh, the warm temperatures and the rain, it has uh, really come on quickly. So uh, uh, now's the time to do that. And folks that have it, uh, it's important to, uh, to pick it regularly because it can grow um, uh, quite a bit in just a 24-hour period once the, the temperatures are above 70. So, and you don't, you, you want to pick asparagus um, so that the tip of the spears uh, remain tight. You don't want to wait until the, the tip of the spear loosens up, or we call that ferning out, and this is what, this is what starts the fiber development in the spear uh, to make it tough. So keep up with your picking and um, don't let any uh, uh, spears elongate into ferns while you're picking because that is a great site for asparagus beetles to lay their eggs on. So keep up with the picking and uh, hopefully you'll have a good, uh, a good season. All righty, we are live in the studio. If you have a question for Carl, you can call 336-599-0266. Mm -hmm. Spring is sprung and the lawn and garden work has begun. Yes, it has. And the man is here to help you with any problems that you may be experiencing. And um, Carl, uh, I'm going to jump right in. And um, uh, I had someone ask me earlier today, was it okay to uh, cut back boxwood shrubs? Yes, boxwoods are starting to grow now. And um, as long as the shrubs are, are in healthy shape, in other words, if, if you have just a little bit of, of growth at the tops of the shrubs and it's bare at the bottom, this, uh, this indicates that the shrub is not doing very well. If you make a drastic pruning to that shrub, it probably will not come back. 
But if you have good growth throughout the shrub from the top through the bottom, uh, yes, you can go ahead and severely prune it back at this time. Now, remember, boxwoods grow very, very slowly, <clears throat> and a lot of people also confuse uh, boxwoods with um, uh, compact hollies. They, they, they call compact hollies boxwoods, and it's, it's two different plants. If you have a compact holly, uh, they respond very well to what we call rejuvenation pruning and you can prune them back really low and they grow back fast. In fact, any in the holly family will, will do that. So, uh, uh, so you can uh, prune back boxwoods now, but remember that they will grow back very, very slowly. Okay. All righty, I think we've got a caller. Good morning, thank you for calling the Gardener's Corner program. Good morning, just wanna know if it's too late to trim Crepe Myrtle. No, no, you can still do it, that, no problem. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks Thank for you. calling in. All right. Have a good day. All righty. That was a good question right there. Mm -hmm. uh, Carl, before we kind of move along to uh, some of the things you have wanted to uh, talk about, uh, <clears throat> I had uh, tried an experiment mm -hmm. of mowing uh, the wild onions. Oh, yeah. And uh, anyway, I kind of mowed them <laughs> on, on the day that uh, – you know, thought that would be best to do it on mm -hmm. uh, by, you know, the uh, by the signs and things like that of what I was told. And, but, you know, I will say I done it on the last day. Well, I didn't have very good results because okay. after I mowed them, uh, when I went back to mow again, uh, I found that they had just grown Re more. Yeah. And, and, you know, which I, I didn't. I didn't want you to say cut them real close to the ground. I just kind of, you know, try try to mow the grass mm. no lower than than three and a half inches, you know. Right. But although you know it saw uh, some some thin spots and it was some wild onions in there, mm -hmm. so I guess what I need to do is move on to step two, and that is to either apply Speed Zone or Trimac. That's correct? right. That's right. Yeah. Uh, speed Zone or Trimac are broadleaf herbicides that will control existing weeds in the lawn, and uh, they contain 2,4-D, MCPP, and dicamba. That's all three of those herbicides are mixed together <clears throat> into one product, and it's called either Speed Zone or Trimac. So it, it will control wild onions and any other broadleaf weeds you have in the lawn. Um, now, uh, as we're getting into further on into the spring, we, we find an abundance of henbit and chickweed in the lawn, and you can also spray uh, 2,4-D to control those weeds, and they will control them, but remember that henbit and chickweed are called winter annuals, so in about another month, they'll, they'll be gone, they'll disappear, they'll die. So if you, if you have those, uh, predominantly those two weeds in the lawn, it really doesn't make sense to spray the, uh, to control henbit and chickweed at this time because the weeds are only going to die anyway. The time to control them is in the, uh, in the fall, uh, early to mid-September, when these plants are very, very small and tiny. Then, then you apply your speed zone and your trimec. You kill the very uh, small weeds and you deny them the chance to overwinter, and then the following spring you won't see them. So that's the best time to control those two. Okay, some useful information. We've got a caller. Good morning. Thank you for calling the Gardener's Corner program. Yes, sir. Hey, this morning. I'm doing well. I hope that you are. Yes, sir. I have a question for Mr. Con uh, Mr. Canalupe. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, when or is it too late to prune uh, crate myrtles? No. No, you can pre still prune them now. Crepe myrtles are one of the latest plants to leaf out, and they produce flowers on brand new growth. Not last year's growth, but brand new growth. So you can go ahead and, and, and prune them at this time. Oh, okay, great. I appreciate it. Thank right, you. Thanks. Appreciate your call. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. What about blackberries, Carl? What would we need to be doing with the blackberry vines? Uh, blackberries, uh, if you haven't pruned the old canes, those are the ones that bore fruit last year. Uh, you can prune those down at, at, uh, at, to the ground. <clears throat> um, they're very easy to, to see because the, the canes that bore fruit last year are, are dead. They're grayish in color, so um, you, you, you take those out. The time to prune uh, the other canes, the, one, the, the live canes that will produce fruit for us this year, 
The ideal time to prune them is, is during the growing season. Once, once they reach about a height of four feet, you pinch the tops out to form side branches uh, to occur. Um, so if you, prune, if you prune them back at this time, realize that whatever you prune are, are, are all one-year-old wood and it, it's all potential fruiting wood. But uh, you, if you do have lateral or side uh, branches and you can follow them back down to the trunk, you can, um, you can prune them back to about 12 inches. In other, words, in other words, prune them back so that you leave a 12 inches of growth that are coming out of the main stem. Uh, that might be a little bit hard to do, being that if you, especially if you didn't prune the the, uh, the tops out last year, but uh, <clears throat> that's what you can do in this point. And you can radically reduce the amount of fruiting canes you have on a blackberry blackberry plant uh, right now, and still have a, a pretty good crop of fruit. Okay. But the idea is to pinch the the new canes out when they're growing during the season. Uh, so that it uh, it forms side branches, so that it makes for easier picking the following year. Now, Carl, when you say the season, season when they are starting to <coughs> bloom and things, is that what you would mean, or a little bit before they start to bloom? <clears throat> well, okay, the the, the 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 canes that are blooming this year, the ones that are going to be pr uh, giving you fruit, they're there. There's there's nothing to prune there, unless okay. uh, um, unless you want to shorten them back if they if they if they kind of when, uh, grew into a bramble patch. Right. The ones that you're pruning back, the one, the, the ones that you're pinching the tops out, are the ones that haven't come up out of the ground yet. Those are the ones that you're going to be pruning out. Okay, I got thro you. Throughout the season. Okay, In other words, okay. the non-fruitful canes. Okay, mm -hmm. I got you. All right. Mm -hmm. Hey, we've got another caller. Okay. Good morning. Thank you for calling the Gardener's Corner program. I guess you all have gotten lots of calls on. Uh, Azalea bushes. No, go, go 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 right ahead. You're gonna be the first. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd like to know what's wrong with them. Uh, last year and this year too, mine looks like the foliage stays dead, and I don't know whether they'll even bloom this time or not. I live uh, north, <laughs> close close to the power plant. Well, it could be several things. Uh, it could be um, maybe azalea lace bug injury. This is the insect that that bleaches the the top of the leaves white and makes it look unsightly. Although that really doesn't cause any problem. Uh, just wait and see. Uh, you know how the plant uh, grows this year. What you might want to do, especially if you haven't uh, done it in a long time, is to take soil samples. Go go out to where the azaleas are growing. Uh, take a small uh, small trowel, take slices of soil about six inches deep, mix them all up in a clean pail, and then uh, take out enough to fill up a Ziploc bag and bring it bring it into the extension office to see what your <coughs> what your soil is lacking. Well, I don't think it's insects. It's really well. It's probably fertility then. So so take soil samples to see what you what you need, and then go by the results of the soil test recommendation. You, your soil could, could maybe need lime and or fertilizer, but uh, you would be ahead of the game if you would just uh, go down about four to six inches in a couple of spots around your azalea plants and uh, get just the soil, if you have any roots or any other, you know, uh, rocks or pebbles, anything in it, take that out. And you only need about a uh, maybe not even a 16 ounce cup of soil. Take it into the Cooperative Extension Service, and they'll send it off and have it tested for you. And right now, those tests are free of charge, and so that maybe could um, you know help you out, you know, for next year to have some real pretty azalea plants. Okay, right. Thank you so much. Hey, All right, thank thanks you. for calling. You have a good day. Appreciate it. <clears throat> uh, yeah, Carl, you know, uh, I, I think some people uh, really don't think too much of the soil sampling because they have never done it before. That's right. But um, I was talking to a, a neighbor friend a few weeks ago, and uh, he was talking about, you know, wanting to do some soil sampling 
that he had never done it before. And um, I said, well, I said, I'll admit, I said, I had never done the soil samples until, you know, Carl had talked about it. Mm -hmm. And I really need to do more sam soil samples than I do. But anyway, and when I say that for, for different things, you know, if you're doing a garden or maybe you've got fruit trees, you need to do soil samples on pretty much about everything where you are cultivating or growing something. And uh, I, I told the guy, I said, you know, you could kind of uh, do and conduct your own experiment. I said, maybe do soil samples on, on one spot. Mm -hmm. And you go by the recommended amount of fertilizer and lime that they suggest. Mm -hmm. I said, then in another spot, don't pay any attention to the recommendations and just kind of do maybe what you think it needs. Mm -hmm. And then kind of look to see how the yield of, of, of both different plots are, you That's know, right. comparable, comparable to. Mm -hmm. and, and, and one thing about the soil samples, uh, in many cases, uh, it will tell you to apply more fertilizer and lime than, than you had planned. But in many cases where you were, were planning to put out fertilizer and lime, you may not need as much of either or. Too, yeah, so. and, <clears throat> and most people are surprised to learn that they think, you know, fertilizer is a cure-all for everything. If, you, if the plants aren't growing good, just add more fertilizer. And that's really a wrong um, uh, <clears throat> idea to have because um, it really doesn't matter how much fertilizer you add, you know, to the soil. If the soil pH is not where it should be, all the fertilizer that you add to the soil remains tied up in the soil. In other words, it's unavailable to the plant. So, you know, as the standard, uh, a lot of people say, well, what's the best fertilizer to use for such and such? Well, there is no best fertilizer. The, the best thing to do is get the soil, get the soil samples so you find out uh, how much um, limestone you need to bring up the soil pH so then when you do add the fertilizer that's recommended from the soil test, you know that it's going to be utilized by the plant. And uh, the results are dramatic because a lot of time uh, <clears throat> we have people uh, that contract out to, you know, various services. Uh, this brings back a situation in Raleigh a few years ago where um, a lawn service was, was hired to take care of the lawn and the, uh, the person had several bare spots in the lawn. And all they did was add fertilizer, and the homeowner couldn't understand why no grass was growing in these spots. So the uh, person sent in a soil sample, and it showed that the pH was around 5.0 from these spots. So no amount of fertilizer is going to improve that situation when the pH is so low. So I recommended don't add any fertilizer, just add limestone. And within, <clears throat> within that, uh, that summer, you, you started to see the Bermuda grass started to take root in those bare spots and, uh, and really did well. So people really need to, uh, to realize that uh, uh, soil sampling to determine your soil pH is, is far more important than just indiscriminate scattering of fertilizer. Um, you know, around uh, on the lawn, and <clears throat> you know, over the years, people say have told me, "Well, I don't have time for a soil test. <laughs> how much do I? How much fertilizer should I should I apply?" I said, "Well, pick a number. That's right. Your it's your guess is as good a as shot in the dark. If you want to throw throw away money and fertilizer, go right ahead. So, but um, once people see the value of soil sampling and see the benefits that it provides." by making the fertilizer that you do add to the plants more available, then once they become a, a believer, then that's, you know, the rest is history then. Well, and you know, one thing that uh, makes the soil sampling more valuable is right now it is a free service. Mm, that's right. From the North Carolina Department of Agriculture. Until Thanksgiving, the soil sampling uh, fees are waived. So if uh, you got a garden spot or something, go ahead and get your soil samples in. 
uh, typically two to three weeks turnaround, so you still got plenty of time mm -hmm. to get your soil sampling done. Also, uh, something else uh, I'm going to make mention of, I know a lot of people will be planning tomatoes uh, within the next month or so, and um, Carl has said many, many times that if you have been planting tomatoes in the same spot of your garden or in a raised bed, if you've been planting tomatoes in that same spot the last several years, it would be a good idea for you to plant your tomatoes in another spot right. because you can get a, um, a buildup of, of different things and you stand a lot more chance of disease, you know, after planting tomatoes in the same spot, you know, four or five years in a row. Yeah, and there's a pretty destructive fungus disease known as southern stem blight or, or southern blight for short. And um, <clears throat> the, uh, the fungal spores remain in, in the ground. And uh, they're just ready, they're just lying there waiting to attack uh, freshly planted plants. So um, <clears throat> the thing to do is, yes, uh, definitely rotate your, your plantings when you plant vegetables. In other words, if, you, if you've planted tomatoes, peppers, and eggplant in, a, in one area, that's all, they're all members of the Solanaceae family. Then the following year, you might want to alternate with the vine crop family. Uh, cantaloupe, cucumber, watermelon, and squash, or the cabbage family. Uh, <clears throat> so you group the different vegetable families uh, together, and then uh, when you replant, make sure that you, you, that you uh, plant uh, the area with a member of, of a different vegetable crop family, and that will, that will keep your, uh, your soil-borne uh, fungus uh, diseases down. Okay. We're going to get a word on for sandling golf cars. They're located 613 Lewis Street in Oxford. They're geared up and ready for spring and summer. And you can do the very same with a new utility trailer, a golf cart, or if you need parts and service for your golf cart, head on down and see them at Sandaline Golf Cars, 613 Lewis Street in Oxford. Get geared up and be ready for spring and summer with a golf car from Sandling Golf Cars. They're your local club car and easy go dealer. They have basic to fully customized units as well as gasoline and electric models of golf cars at Sandling Golf Cars, 613 Lewis Street in Oxford. See them for your XRTs. They have both the 950 and the 1550 models in stock. These rugged, doable, dependable machines, strong enough to handle anything around the farm, home, or lake. Sandling Golf Cars is open for business Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. until 5.30, Saturdays at 9 until 1. The telephone number to Sandling Golf Cars is 919-693-4626, toll free 1-800-221-9267. Are you in need of parts of service for your golf car? Sandling Golf Cars can help out. They are also your local Trojan battery dealer. Do you need a utility trailer? They have open body utility trailers, enclosed trailers, stock trailers, dump trailers, tow dollies. Also enjoy the spring and summer grilling out with a Wilmington Grill available from Sandling Golf Cars, 613 Lewis Street in Oxford where financing is available. Stop in and see Al Hillary O'Will this week at Sandling Golf Cars, 613 Lewis Street in Oxford. Call 919-693-4626. Toll free 1-800-221-9267. Check them out on the web at sandlinggolfcars.com. <clears throat> Here we are back on the Gardener's Corner program, and uh, we appreciate you tuning in today. Uh, my name is Rob Hall, Mr. Carl Cantalupi of the North Carolina Cooperative Extension Service, our resident expert. Um, 
And the show today is brought to you by San Lean Golf Cars, who we just heard a word from. And we'll be checking out T.G. Brooks coming up in just a few minutes. Uh, Carl, uh, let's kind of just jump right in. And um, you had had some topics that mm -hmm. you wanted to, to make mention of today. So right. let's Th move right along. Okay, things that are current right now. Um, Everybody uh, is concerned year after year about the fungus disease called cedar apple rust. Cedar apple rust is a fungus disease that, um, ha that survives on two different host plants. Uh, <clears throat> one host plant is the cedar tree or juniper, and then the other plant is the, uh, is the apple. <clears throat> and this, uh, in this picture, you can see on the right a, a gall that is forming on the cedar tree. Um, the, during the first year, the gall remains brown, and then in the second year, the, the brown gall opens up and it exudes these orange jelly-like tentacles. Um, as you, and <clears throat> you can see a, a more mature one on the left, and as we go along here, we can see uh, this is actually the stage of what the cedar apple rust galls look on cedar trees right now. The, the galls have opened up, and you can see these, these kind of globs, orange globs, hanging from the, the trees. Uh, almost looks like uh, something from outer space. Sounds like a creature. <laughs> Cre yeah. Creature feature. <laughs> <laughs> but from these jelly-like galls, then spores, spores of the fungus or seeds of the fungus, will blow onto apple trees. <clears throat> Get some more. Here's another picture of one here. They, they blow onto apple trees and they form these orange and um, yellow spots on the leaves. Here's a close-up uh, version of, of what it looks like. And uh, a lot of times, if the uh, apples are severely infected, it can cause the, the, uh, the leaves to fall, to fall off the tree. And of course, once, the, once you do have the symptoms show up on the apple tree, it's too late to spray. So right now, the thing to do is look at the stage of growth on your apple tree, uh, apple or crab apple. And once the, the flower petals have fallen down, uh, then go ahead and, and start to use the fungicide called Immunox, I-M-M-U-N-O-X. Immunox can be added to your fruit spray mixture if you're starting to add materials to control insects and diseases on your fruit trees, the best time to do it is right after petal fall. And um, so along with your general fruit tree spray, add the Immunox to it. Now you need to do this uh, throughout a, a six week period. So if you're spraying once every 10 to 14 days, then do that and add the Immunox until uh, six weeks has gone by, have gone by. Then after six weeks, the galls on the cedar tree will dry up. Once the galls dry up, there's no, uh, no more infection can take place, and uh, the spores will be ineffective. Uh, uh, the spores will not blow and affect the apple tree leaves. So, um, so that's what you need to do. Then the, the other thing with the cedar apple rust, uh, how, this, how the fungus uh, reproduces is that once it produces an orange the orange and yellow spots on the apple tree leaves if you turn the leaf over and you look real closely you can see a very very small um, tentacle or tentacles that are produced on the underside of the leaves they produce the spores which blow back to the cedar tree and start the two-year life cycle over again so uh, the, the most important thing uh, for, for people that have uh, uh, fruit trees to do is to um, uh, go ahead and spray to control the cedar apple rust. Uh, m many people say, well, I, I, should I cut down the cedar tree? Well, you can, but the spores blow for miles around. So that's really not a good alternative. So keep up with your sprays knowing that some years the infestations are going to be more than, than in other years because it all depends. In order for fungi to, to, to attack plants, you have to have the, the right fungus, you have to right, have the right host plant, and you have to have the right temper, temperature and humidity. In the absence of, of any one of those three, you will not get the disease. So things have to, be, things have to kind of line up in order to uh, to get it so and and some years it's worse than others depending on the environment 
Carl, we've got a call, okay. but before we get to the call, mm -hmm. just a, a quick question about the spraying regiment. Uh, if if it turns out that we continue to have a a wet spring, should you spray more often? Yes, <clears throat> if we have uh, wet weather, of course the the uh, pesticides are going to wash off the uh, leaves, which indicates that you should spray more often. Um, <clears throat> uh, I mentioned before you can buy a general fruit tree spray, which contains malathion for sucking insects, methoxychlor for chewing insects and captan fungicide to control fungus diseases. And you can see here immunox is needed for cedar apple rust, what we had just gone over. Streptomycin can be used for fire blight, the destructive bacteria. Actually, that can be applied right now during full bloom of apple and pear. Nothing else should be applied during full bloom, but the streptomycin can be applied. And one thing to remember, if you're using the insecticide 7 or carbaryl, do not use that on apples or crab apples until 30 days after petal fall. Otherwise, the 7 insecticide acts as a great thinning agent, and it will, you will very effectively eliminate your entire fruit crop. Wow, some useful <laughs> information. So, uh, Good morning. Thank you for calling the Gardener's Corner program. Hey, um, I got a question on the azaleas. I got some that's way overgrown, about 5, 6 feet tall. And I was wondering if it would kill them if you cut them back to like two foot or no, it won't. It won't kill them as long as the plant is healthy to begin with. But I probably wouldn't do it until the azaleas finish blooming. Yeah. Okay. Well, some of them look pretty good. Some of them don't. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Well, that's up to you. Yeah, you can you can prune them now if you want to. Yeah, you can prune them back severely. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Appreciate thanks for call. calling. Thank you. When I call. Um, when you advise to, to wait to prune them back after they have finished blooming, and that is the reason uh, you will be cutting off what would be blooming. Exactly, and, yeah. And, and you wouldn't have the... You wouldn't have any flowers, the yeah. pretty flowers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. We are live in the studio today. You can give us a call, 599 That's 599 And uh, you can pose your question to Mr. Carl Cantalupi and um, <clears throat> maybe he can help you uh, come up with a solution to take care of the problem that you may be having. Right. Um, Carl, um, now uh, a little bit before the show you had a, a phone call and we had made mention of this uh, in the last couple of weeks about uh, ground nesting bees mm -hmm. and um, really uh, no problems with them or anything. They just dig little holes where the turf is thin and uh, they are not a nuisance or harmful or anything, correct? That's correct. Yeah, they, uh, they're ground nesting bees and they, and they make um, uh, mounds in the lawn, especially in, in lawn areas where, the, where, as you said, where the turf is, is thin. And so, um, but some people get, get real scared and that uh, they're afraid that they're going to sting them. Uh, but really, they're, they're kind of friendly and they're not, they're not really aggressive <clears throat> at all. Um, so there's no need for chemical control. If you want to rake over the, uh, the roughened areas, uh, with a rake, <coughs> that's fine. Actually, they they provide a little bit of of uh, soil aeration, so that's that's not you know that's not bad at all. And uh, I'm trying to go through my uh, my slides here to find uh, where well, I have pictures of them. But we did sh we did show some. Oh, here we are. We did show some uh, last week, and and this is what you'll see if you look out out over your lawn area. Uh, you see a bunch of these uh, soil mounds that have been excavated and, and deposited on the top of the soil. <clears throat> if you look real close, you can see one hole in each mound. That's where the bee, um, you know, uh, comes out of. But again, if you see this, there's really nothing to be alarmed about. Uh, they'll, they'll disappear just about as fast as, as they've come. Uh, here's a shot of uh, a bee that's emerging uh, from the mound and uh, ones that have... Um, emerge from the mounds and, and new female nests. And here's a close-up of what, uh, what the bee looks like, just to put it in perspective uh, of, of size. 
Uh, Carl made mention a little while ago about do not use seven on your uh, apples or crab apples until at least 30 days after all the blooms have came off of your trees. That's right. Uh, because he says when you do use it on an apple or crab apple tree, uh, it kind of will serve as a thinning agent. But also, while just want to make mention, um, you would help the bee population, the honey bee population, when using seven if you would use the water soluble mm -hmm. uh, seven. Uh, and, and, you know, throughout the gardening season, you know, when you have uh, insects and things, uh, if you put seven dust out, what pretty much happens is if a honeybee should come and uh, light on that plant where it's seven dust at, it won't hurt that one particular bee at that time, but when that bee goes back to the hive, it could take seven dust back into the hive, right? and it could be very harmful to the honeybees. So at times when you can, use the water-soluble seven uh, just for that simple reason. You know, and, and, and another reason when you use a uh, water-soluble seven, if it's a little bit breezy or something, you don't really have to worry about it per se blowing away. That's right, yeah. So if you use either liquid seven or a, a wettable powder seven that you mix with water, once the spray residue dries on the plant, it's fine. It's not going to hurt the bees. So, um, so very rarely do I recommend using uh, uh, dust formulations of, of the insecticide seven. The only exception uh, is that if you have problems with corn earworm on sweet corn, you can actually uh, take the seven dust and uh, with a paintbrush and dust it on top of the uh, the sweet corn uh, silks, and that provides a good barrier for when the uh, corn earworm moth lays eggs on the silk. Uh, it get it will <clears throat> the as the egg is hatching into the larval stage, they'll get killed before they get a chance to move into the ear. So that's one one uh, way that uh, you can use seven. Uh, dust. The other time, the other uh, time you can use uh, seven dust is to control carpenter bees, which are actually making their presence known right now. And every, anybody that has a wooden structure can attest to the fact that uh, these carpenter bees will drill holes in, the, you know, uh, on the uh, <clears throat> undersides of carports, wooden furniture, anything that you. Uh, that you might have, and uh, just looking at if you if you look one in, look at one in, in cross section, here's the tunnel of a carpenter bee. But um, information from um, Mike Waldvogel, one of our state extension entomologists, um, says that uh, recent warm temperatures have led to increased activities by carpenter bees. The initial activity is. Uh, typically by the males who are busy buzzing about waiting for the lady bee of their dreams to make her appearance. I, I like the way he writes. Uh, the males can be territorial and, <clears throat> and will harass people sitting on wooden park benches, porches, or near other areas where the bees were busy last year. The males have a white spot in the middle of their foreheads and you can actually spot it if the bees hover around you. Uh, people are likely to see new holes being bored as well as possibly old galleries being cleaned out. The key sign of activity, other than the bees themselves, is the very coarse sawdust-like debris found nearby along with splatterings of carpenter bee excrement. And uh, here's a shot that uh, you can actually see the, uh, the excrement uh, just drilling underneath the, the uh, uh, <coughs> fascia board of uh, a structure. Uh, unfortunately, there's nothing new on the control front. If anything, the pyrethroid insecticides such as permethrin, bifenthrin, and cyfluthrin, which are the active ingredients in the products made by spectricide, ortho, and Bayer Advanced, applied to exposed wooden surfaces may, may provide some repellency, but the uh, NC State entomologists believe it would probably be short-lived in its impact. Again, the major problem is twofold. 
Uh, first, having an effective chemical residue that endures throughout the entire period of bee activity and also being able to apply any pesticide to all of the surfaces that need protection, particularly overhead on soffit and fascia boards. So other than swatting the bees, your next best option is to apply a pesticide into the holes, the active galleries. Uh, seven dust can be used in this respect, can be quite effective. Wait about 24 hours after application before you seal up the holes with putty to make sure that you get bees entering the treated opening. So when they get, the, get it on their, on their bodies um, uh, by going in and out, this, this is good. Uh, <clears throat> but this waiting period, 24 hours, uh, a lot of people don't do this because it means a second trip up the ladder on successive days. You can wait longer, but it's a good idea to seal the holes to keep out moisture. And overall, a tennis racket is still your best weapon against the adults and a mildly um, entertaining uh, early season activity. <laughs> Make get some exercise, that way too, squatting at them. That's right. And always be sure that your swinging radius is shorter than the distance between the bees and anyone else standing nearby. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're going to get a word on for T.G. Brooks Company, and, and, and we'll be back with more Gardener's Corner right after uh, this word. And, and we are live in the studio today, 599-0266 is the telephone number. If you have a uh, question for Carl, we've got a few more minutes of the show. But right now, we'll head down to Timberlake and stop in at T.G. Brooks Company. The month of April, we love it. Spring bursting open. T.G. Brooks Company is ready. They've got them in. They have tomato plants, cabbage, broccoli, collards, lettuce, Brussels sprouts, herbs like basil, chives, thyme, oregano, dill, cilantro, peppermint. They have lavender. They're geared up for the planting season. April is the month to really get things going for spring and summer. Fresh garden seeds are in and ready to plant. Reseed your lawn with clean, fresh seed. And they have the fertilizer, lime, herbicides for weed control. And if you need mulch, wow, do they ever have mulch, even the triple ground of mulch. Do you need straw, pine needles? How about potting soil, planting soil, or cow manure? They have spreaders. They have aerators for sale or for rent. No matter if you are the homeowner or if you are a commercial landscaper, T.G. Brooks Company handles everybody with the same courteous service. They can arrange delivery or you can pull up in your pickup truck, your trailer. They'll load your mulch for you. The bag products like pine mulch, they'll load it in your car or in your trailer or your SUV or your van. It's exciting to see spring and April in the growing season. When the day's all done, nothing tops it off like a hand-cut ribeye steak here in April, cooked to your liking on your grill. Make tracks to 411 Helena Mariah Road in Timberlake and phone them at 364-2428. As always, T.G. Brooks Company has proudly served the homeowner, the farmer, and those in construction since way back in 1936. They welcome people from all over Person County, Rougemont, Northern Durham, and of course, Southern Person County. T.G. Brooks Company. Here we are back on the Gardener's Corner program and um, appreciate you all tuning in today. The program is brought to you by T.G. Brooks Company and Sandling Golf Cars. Should you ever have the opportunity to send some business our way, please do so and let them know that you appreciate the support that they show to us here on the Gardens Corner program. If it wasn't for them, the show would not be possible. Um, Carl, um, a quick question for you. Mm -hmm. Now, here it is, uh, just pretty much um, not even the middle of April yet. Right. Uh, and it's supposed to be uh, in the 80s today, low 80s. Mm -hmm. uh, then tomorrow, Saturday, I think it's supposed to be in the 70s. What about frost? What are we looking as far as frost chances? Yeah, there's still up until on April 15th, it's still a 50% chance of frost. So for all the anxious gardeners that are 
really wanting to get out the warm season vegetables, tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, uh, <coughs> cucumbers, watermelons, still too early, would not take a chance on setting them out because um, we will get frost. I guarantee we will get frost. Um, and, and, and it won't be until the first week of May until that frost chance drops down to 5%. And uh, a lot of people think that April 15th is our frost-free date. It's, it's actually our mean, M-E-A-N, frost-free date. It's an average frost-free date. And uh, we still have a 50% chance of frost. So, so hold back on uh, planting your warm season vegetables until that time. Uh, because, uh, and even if we do get cold temperatures and we might not get a frost, uh, as long as the temperatures stay cool, warm season vegetables uh, don't like cold weather or cold temperatures. So they're really just going to sit there outside and, and do nothing, even, even if they don't get damaged by frost. So, so it's a good idea to wait. Okay, another question. Uh, if you want to maybe get out and start spraying some weed killer and stuff like that, uh, is it okay to do that? I mean, what temperature does it need to be for okay, that Okay, that's a good question. Um, any temperatures over 45 degrees are fine for what we call phenoxy herbicides. These are the ones that contain the herbicide 2,4-D, your speed zone and your trimec, but be very careful. <clears throat> and actually, it's, it's, it's good that you brought this up, Rob, because I had a... Um, a greenhouse grower um, that had some tomato transplants growing in his greenhouse and I went out and and looked the other day and the uh, these tomato uh, plants that he's selling you know in six packs um, had twisting and distortion and to me it looked it was looked like 2,4-D injury and uh, the problem with 2,4-D is, is if you apply it, uh, temperatures over 85 degrees, the, the droplets vaporize. And then if you have a wind, it carries those droplets far, far away from the, the target that you're, that you're originally applying it to. And another thing that can happen uh, sometimes if 2,4-D uh, herbicides are spray on a day where there is no wind and we get what we call air inversions, where you know, I'm sure you've seen um, you ride around and 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 you look up and you see someone that's um, you know has a wood burning stove, and the smoke just stays still; it doesn't move. Right. That's an air inversion. So the the same thing happens when you apply herbicides under an air inversion; they just hang the herbicide droplets hang in the air. Then when the the air in, inversion lifts and and the air starts to circulate again. Those droplets are still in, in the, the air. in the air in the vapor stage, and they'll take them wherever. So, as long as it's above 45 degrees mm -hmm. and below 85 degrees, below is 85. the best time to all uh, spray. Right, and 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 don't and don't spray if if there's an air inversion. So, or uh, if it's real windy. Or if it's real windy, and uh, with this greenhouse grower, you know it's. You look at the damage inside, and it's you know, it's 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 all over the place. It's 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 random, and it just depends on how the wind was blowing that particular day. And and once the l tiny vegetable transplants are injured with herbicide, um, yeah, and it kills the it, and it, and it alters the growing point. That's it. There's yeah. nothing you can do with those plants. Well, we'll, we'll call. Is he thinking that it was some spraying done outside of the greenhouse? No, it was not. Uh, as 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 far as his knowledge, and I, you know, his, as far as he's uh, concerned, uh, I asked him those questions. If he did, you spray in or around the greenhouse with 2,4-D? No. Uh, did you use a sprayer that uh, had herbicide in it before, and then you then you put insecticides in it? No. So we're eliminating the obvious here. So the only right. other thing can be is is drift. Uh, you know, from uh, from other areas. And um, a, a year or so ago, there was a man that lived out in the country, planted a whole bunch of muscadine grapes. He had uh, two or three rows of, of muscadines, and then all of a sudden, one day, he, he looks and all the leaves are twisted and distorted. And, uh, you know, there again, two 4-D type herbicides out in the country, uh, grower spray, who who, who, you know, how are you going to prove who did it? 
And uh, it, it's, just, it's just awful because grapes and tomatoes are two excellent indicator plants of 2,4-D damage. And that year, he got very little, a very little uh, grape crop. So, so, so pretty much, uh, you need to be mindful of when you're spraying uh, herbicides mm -hmm. because not only can you be causing problems for yourself, but you could be causing problems for your, you know, neighboring that's, that's right. property owners. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I want to make mention of one thing. Carl's got something he wants to close the show out with. Uh, the food pantry of Roxborough will be opening this afternoon on Friday afternoon at 2 o'clock. Uh, they normally open at 10 o'clock on Friday mornings, but they are receiving a truckload of fruit and produce from the food bank. But the food pantry will be open this afternoon at 2 o'clock. They'll have fruit and produce. The food pantry of Roxborough is located 704 Franklin Street. Okay, Carl, we got just a few minutes. Uh, All right. I was thinking you had something else. I did, but it was, it's, it's probably going to take more time, so we'll end with this topic. Uh, hopefully it's, uh, <clears throat> it's large enough for people to see. Uh, this time of the year, we, we, get, we, we start to get termites uh, swarming around the area. And people get excited, and they th uh, some people think they have termites when in actuality they don't. They just have flying ants. And the way to tell the difference between an ant and a termite, the ant has what we call a wasp waist that, um, or a constricted waist, and it's composed of three body segments, the head, the thorax, and the abdomen, and the waist uh, are the waists are constricted at the end of those segments. so, so an ant has a segmented body. Uh, it also they also have elbowed antenna, and um, the the wings are of of an ant are unequal in size. Now you if you look at the termite on the right, the termite has a solid body. It is not segmented like an ant. The antenna is uh, the antennas are straight. And the, the wings are of equal size. The scientific name for the genus of uh, termites are Isoptera, and uh, that means equal winged. So uh, that's the difference uh, between ants and termites. If you still have a hard time identifying them, uh, come into the extension office, and we can definitely take a, a, a look at them for you. Well, if you, if you, if you see either or, how should you control them, Carl? Um, if, ter if you do have, uh, well, if it's ants, ants can be easily controlled with a, um, a granular insecticide applied around the foundation of the house. Uh, if you have termites, that's best left to a professional. Uh, I'll exterminate them. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and the thing to remember, if you do find out that you do have termites, it's not like, um, you know, the cartoons that we watched uh, when we were kids that showed the termites <laughs> eating the house down in, in overnight. Yeah. Termites work very, very slowly. So even if you have a termite damage, do not feel pressured to sign on the dotted line uh, after, you know, the first person comes out. Get several estimates, see what the control uh, covers, what it doesn't cover, and take plenty of time to, to make the decision before you hire on to someone. Um, and there's a lot of hor horror stories out there, people, you know, coming into the elderly and, and making a sales pitch, or they, they come into a house and say, oh, well, uh, I think y you have termites because I've, I've found the termites in the trees. <laughs> uh, all, all these bizarre, th bizarre things. So you, you want to stay away from fraudulent people. All right. Mm -hmm. That's going to do it for us on the Gardener's Corner program. Mm -hmm. Be sure to check out RadioRoxburgh.com to see past editions of the Gardener's Corner program. Thanks goes out to T.G. Brooks Company and Sandling Golf Cars. Special thanks to our listeners and viewers and Mr. Carl Cantalipi of the North Carolina <laughs> Cooperative Extension Service. Thank you. Have a great and safe weekend, and we look forward to seeing you next week with another edition of the Gardener's Corner program.